All right, so tip number one is master the sketch environment. Fusion 360 is essentially a, if you can sketch it, you can build it kind of software. So mastering the sketch environment is arguably the most important skill you can possibly learn. Sketches are the foundation and framework of your entire design. Not only do they define and connect the shapes you're trying to create, they set the rules for all of the other modeling tools and make their results more predictable. It's no wonder that when something in your design isn't working as you expect, it almost always has something to do with one of your sketches. So spend a lot of time getting your sketches right. Learn how to create the planes, the construction geometry, the constraints and projections that you need in an efficient and methodical way. And I promise you that Fusion will become a much more forgiving and enjoyable program to use. While we're on the topic of sketches, tip number two is dimension only what you care about and constrain the rest. One of the most common mistakes I see is way too many dimensions and not enough constraints. Constraints are the relationships that you give to your sketch geometry, such as I need these lines to be connected or parallel or perpendicular to each other, while dimensions specify the size and scale of that constrained geometry. You almost never want to apply a dimension unless you actually know what that dimension is supposed to be and it's one that you actually care about. So let constraints do as much of the heavy lifting as possible and then only dimension the areas that specify your specific design criteria. And lastly on sketches, tip number three is don't fall into the 3D sketch trap. The 3D sketch checkbox is very tempting to use when you find yourself needing to create or maybe connect geometry that can't be drawn from a single plane. This feature allows you to break through those single plane restrictions and draw in just about any direction you want. However, and this is a big deal, not only are they very difficult to use and can't be fully constrained, they almost always break your timeline when trying to make changes to your design. But more importantly, when you find yourself reaching for the 3D sketch, it usually is a sign that you haven't deployed the right workflow for that geometry and need to be using a different technique. For example, extruding a cut through a surface from two different directions can often generate the same result. Other features like split face or intersection curve work on the same principles where if you can sketch what you need from at least two different orientations, you can let Fusion do the heavy lifting and calculate the third, aka a 3D sketch. Tip number four is hierarchy of toolkits. Now there are many different modeling toolkits in Fusion, each with their own pros and cons, such as solid or surface modeling, as well as form and even mesh tools. But when should you use each one and should one maybe be prioritized over the other? Well, yes and no. A general rule that you should follow is attempting to use the solid or sheet metal kits first, as those contain the most robust and stable features for your primary geometry. However, sometimes neither of those are either practical or have the tools you actually need to get the job done. So if you find yourself in that situation, you should either reach for the surface or form tools. They give you a higher degree of control over specific aspects of your design, but generally are more complicated to use and can be very finicky when making changes to your design. Lastly, the mesh tools aren't particularly useful for generating new designs, but they can be a lifesaver when needing to modify an existing design that you found online or imported from another software. So again, the order should be solid and sheet metal, then surface, then form, and then finally mesh. Tip number five is hierarchy of features. There's also a hierarchy of features you should use similar to the more generic toolkits I just mentioned. Extrude and revolve, for example, should always be used first when appropriate then sweep, then loft, and then patch. Now, of course, those are not all of the features available and there are many, many more, but those features generally are responsible for about 90% of your modeling. Extrude and Revolve generate the highest surface quality with the least modeling complexity, but the big downside is they are only limited to a single axis and a single sketch profile. Now, this is where sweep and loft really start to shine. Sweep allows you to go off axis by extruding a profile along a path. However, depending on the path, sweep can sometimes generate unwanted surface qualities. Now, loft is the big monster here. Similar to sweep, it allows you to build geometry along a path, 
but it also lets you change the shape at any point along that path with additional sketch profiles. It offers the most control over the surface quality, but you have to be very careful and very deliberate with how you set up your sketches in order to be successful. Now lastly, Patch, like the name suggests, fills in the gaps that the other features leave behind. Sometimes there are areas of your design where just none of the other tools seem to work. So Patch is like laying a blanket over that area and matching it to the neighboring surfaces. Patch can be an absolute lifesaver but again, should only be used when the other tools can't do what you need. Tip number six is learn to time travel. Fusion 360 is a parametric software. This means that as you start modeling, Fusion stores a timeline of your sketches and features. And each time you wanna make changes to your design, Fusion rebuilds that timeline in the order it was created. This is the Fusion 360 equivalent of time travel. Now, why is this important? Well, let's say you get halfway through your model only to realize you made a big mistake. Instead of losing all that progress and having to delete your features and maybe start again, you can simply go back to that section of the timeline, make a few changes, and all of your future features that you had made will update accordingly. But you can also get really creative with this because sometimes you don't exactly know how to model something or what the size of something should be. So you can start building what you do know and discover what is required for the rest as you go along and make changes. So it kind of becomes an iterative process where the past informs the future and the future informs the past. So utilizing the timeline correctly can both save you a headache down the road, but also help you model correctly in the first place. Tip number seven is that time travel is dangerous. While using the timeline correctly is essential, like I mentioned before, it does come with some dangers. The downside to being able to time travel in Fusion 360 is that each feature you add to the timeline, the model becomes a little bit more complex, a little harder for your computer to manage, and generally more temperamental. Think of the timeline like a series of chains. If one of the chain links breaks, any link that was reliant on that may collapse. In other words, any changes to a feature earlier in your timeline may negatively impact how other features that relied on that feature will respond. This is why sometimes Fusion throws a lot of errors across the entire timeline when you make a change. Now, one way to combat this is to try to make the timeline as short as possible. The less links that there are in the chain, the less opportunity for failure. You can also mitigate this by using as few of projections as possible and modeling each component separately with basically no references to each other. But that often makes the modeling process more tedious and difficult. So learning how to model in the least amount of steps possible with the least amount of codependencies will not only speed up your design process, but make your model more responsive and reliable. Tip number eight is stay organized. It's very easy for a project to become an unruly mess of bodies, components, sketches, features, and planes. Staying organized may not help all that much with a very simple model, but when you start getting into assemblies with a large number of components, it becomes pretty much essential. The best way to start getting organized is to create new components for every separate item in your design. Think of this like the folder structure in Windows. You want to be able to quickly identify and navigate to the items you're trying to edit. Another benefit of doing everything as separate components is that it also allows you to create joints between those components. Rather than simply drawing them in place, you can draw them at the origin point and then later move them to where they actually need to be. Another important way to stay organized is to always name your sketches and features as you go. When you create a new sketch, name it something that will tell you exactly what it is when you need to find it later down the road. You can also do this to items in your timeline as well for when you need to track down, let's say, a misbehaving loft. Lastly, if you're ever going to share your model online or maybe with a coworker or a friend, keeping a nicely organized model will definitely help keep them on your good side. Tip number nine is start with simple projects that you actually care about. Too often, I see people taking on projects that are either way too hard for their skill level or not pushing themselves enough by doing simple projects that they'll never actually use. Projects that are too hard can often feel overwhelming, 
take way too long and possibly cause you to lose motivation altogether. And projects that are too simple won't really help you grow as a designer. So the best way to build your skill in Fusion is to always take on projects that are slightly above your skill level, but something you really care about completing. This way, you'll have to learn new techniques to be successful, but you'll actually stay motivated enough to see it through. In the end, it's all about getting better and having fun while you're doing it. So challenge yourself, but don't shoot for the moon unless you're prepared for a long journey. And lastly, tip number 10 is think like an engineer before you think like an artist. Fusion 360 was designed with engineering and product development teams in mind. This is evident at almost every level of the software. A good example of this is that sketches are much more akin to a precision schematic rather than a digital painting. You create and define functional geometry rather than just freeform drawing. Now, don't get me wrong, having an artistic eye is extremely useful when developing high quality models. But the old adage, function over form, comes to mind. You see, people will put up with a screwdriver that is ugly or maybe uncomfortable so long as it actually does its job. But nobody wants to use a screwdriver that can't tighten or loosen anything simply because it looks and feels great. In reality, both aspects are important. So think like an engineer and consider the function, the tolerances, the ergonomics, and the manufacturability of your designs. Then use that artistic eye to truly make it something inspiring to behold. This is why I love designing guitars. They, to me, are the epitome of what happens when you combine critical functionality, meticulous precision, and artistic vision. If you'd like to support the channel and help me continue to make videos like this, the best way to do that is a donation at patreon.com forward slash Austin Shaner. If you'd like to join an amazing community of hobbyists, luthiers, engineers, and designers from all over the world, you should consider joining our Discord server. Links will be in the description below. But that's it for this video. Thank you for coming. This is Austin, signing out.